Aloha, I am your host, Winston Welch, and I am delighted that you're joining us today for this very special edition of Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, and events with the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any views or opinions expressed by me are strictly my own and not connected with any organization. Joining me in the studio today, I am delighted to have Charlene Chan Lum and Bruce Lum of Save Ala Moana Beach Park Hui. We also have Dr. Brian Bagnall, president of the Greater Waikiki Outdoor Circle. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the issues involving the Ala Moana Beach Park and uh, some proposals that have stirred a little bit of controversy and are still stirring some controversy, as well as some successes that we've had uh, from the city in making the park more beautiful. So we'd like to share that with you today. And we welcome uh, you to the show. And thanks to you all for being my guest today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. So we have been going around and around with the, the city a little bit on this. Mm -hmm. You started this beach park. Could you tell us just a brief history about what that is? Well, basically, um, the, the mayor has had a plan for a few years about what he would like to do the park. And various citizens have talked about, you know, keep it clean, keep it green. Um, but the plan has continued with some, a few more uh, costly the projects and uh, so Save All Moana Beach Park who we formed because we were trying to let the public know what they were about and try to inform the public because they haven't had any uh, city state meet city town hall meetings in the last two years and and how long has your coup been going on for it's as I said just kind of we, we were part of Malama Moana and then we formed this group in the beginning of this year okay and Malama Moana uh is another uh, group that's that's also in interested is as right. as is uh, the greater Waikiki Outdoor Circle. Yes. And uh, tell us, Dr. Bagnall, about the Outdoor Circle's uh, involvement in the park, uh, as far as you're aware, um, and its history. It goes back a long way. Louise Dillingham in 1929, remember the canal that her husband was very much involved with was completed around about then. And she was president of the Outdoor Circle. And she was a major mover and shaker of getting Ala Moana Park as it is today. And the trees, the feeling of open space, so we feel a strong connection to what she did all those years ago and all those women who fought to have a beautiful place in the city with trees and open space. Trees and open space. And I think that's an important point with, mm -hmm. with uh, what we're looking for is to preserve a sense of open space that the open space is actually critical to the park itself, to its original design and to a city that's... <laughs> bursting at the seams right now. Right. Um, as you were saying earlier, Shar, that, that uh, this is like a country park for a lot of folks that live right. in, in this area because they don't get a chance to go to the North Shore or, or uh, you know, Kailua. There is so much cement around the, you know, our city nowadays that, and people are stuck in those little apartments. So truly, Almona Beach Park is like a country park for a lot of people. They can come out and camp or put their tents up. They can go um, to the beach and go fishing just run around and enjoy the big open spaces that are there for them. So, you know, trying to preserve the park the way it is, that way so that it is kind of like part of the country for these people is really important. And for many, many generations, people have enjoyed the park that way. And it's an amazing park because when you go there at night, and I was there just the other day, it's looking terrific now. And to see everybody doing all the different things they do there, swimming, paddling, mm -hmm. walking. It's, it's just an amazing place, the combination of the beach and the park. It's a unique place, I think, almost in the world. And, and you, uh, the city had proposed about 20 or so major changes in there, and, and uh, maybe 15 of them have gone. Well, it's pretty uncontroversially, like, like redoing the bathrooms and, and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Brian, what sort of changes have you seen at the park that, that are positive? Well, remember when the mayor first talked about what he wanted to do and there were going to be colored walk paths and people said, well, we don't want that. So I think they've focused initially on getting the essentials fixed. And I think they're done now. The irrigation system, the grass has never looked better. The trees have never looked better. They're just finishing repaving the road. Uh, Magic Island and the parking lot there is just being done. And it's, it's look, it looks terrific. And I think it's, it's the way the park was meant to be. And so my feeling personally would be Congratulations, it looks great. No, time to stop. Don't yeah. bother doing anything. More. Leave well enough alone. Leave well enough alone. Right. And Bruce, would you agree with that? Is the park looking good? Is it time to leave well enough alone? In fact, just the other day I was uh, saying to Charlene, we should write to the mayor and oh. congratulate him on picking up on the key things that we wanted was for him to just love the park. And right now the park does look like it's getting more love. And the, certainly the driveway down the center is a real 
uh, welcome improvement since we don't have all those potholes anymore. If you remember uh, back uh, a couple years ago, that's what people were really saying. I think Dick Allgaier said at one time very emphatically at the end of one of his videos, he said, please fix the blink potholes. <laughs> right. So it's just a matter of like catching up on, I think I saw Director Nakota saying, sometimes 30 or 40 years of kind of deferred maintenance. And right. I think that's a, 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 a huge thing, of course, obviously. Yes. And you know, the mayor has been mayor for the last six, seven years. And so it's, it's a good thing that they're beginning to do the roads, which, you know, and take care of the bathrooms. Because a lot of the uh, common people, everybody, everyday people have said, just keep it clean, keep it green, keep the bathrooms maintained. Fix what we got, remember? Fix what we got, right. We don't really need a big $133 million project that's going to cost of taxpayers more money. We just want to love the park the way it was and, intended. And the park is full now. You, mm -hmm. you, there's no more parking spaces for extra activities. So if you go there in the evening or in the morning, particularly at sunset, it's full. There's no more room to be trying to get 500 more people in there with their cars. And so, uh, so that, that brings us to several points, I think, that, that we uh, wanted to touch on today. There's four main items, I guess, that are remaining of contention. And I think Perhaps if, if the mayor is listening and, and his managing director and the parks director, which I, I'm sure that they do watch out and about because this is the most important news you're going to get all day. Uh, but <laughs> if they are watching, then we have a few things there. And I think one of them is about the dog park. The other one is about parking. The other one is about uh, sand. Seat. I'm sorry, the, the sand playground. replenishment and then uh, the world class playground. So, uh, Brian, you've been working on a, I guess we could call it maybe a mini task force uh, put together by one of the neighborhood boards in the area about dog parks. And tell us what you found because the city is proposing to have a dog park in Ala Moana. Why is this not the best idea in the world and what are some alternatives to it? And what have you found in your Well, research? one of the council members, uh, Council Member Fukunaga, said, Why don't you guys, through the uh, Kaka'ako Alamoana Neighborhood Board. Mm -hmm. They have a wonderful little uh, community action committee right. get together. And because I'm a veterinarian, they thought I might bring some professional expertise into this. So I went around and studied some of the... Now, we're talking about fenced dog parks. There's a very special difference between an unfenced dog park and a fenced dog park. And uh, so I went to visit some of them and uh, took some photographs and and studied also there's a lot of literature about dog parks on the internet the kennel club has a full document about it so you don't need to reinvent things you want to you want to build the dog park read the kennel club booklet on what what a dog park requires the akc yes akc american kennel club. and what have you found do you find that we don't need a, a dog park at all or have you found that, that there's a better location for it or what are the reasons why we wouldn't thing, want it? I think the, the main thing is that fenced off-leash dog parks should be in remote locations. The dogs often go there make a hell of a lot of noise. Uh, you, when people are walking their dogs to the park, you don't want them crossing heavy traffic and dangerous things. Mm -hmm. And you don't, want, you don't want crowds of people because that can disturb the dogs and everything. So they tend to be, the recommendation is remote locations about a half to one acre. So that slide. I have to one acre. Okay, we do have a couple slides on this one here. I think uh, so. That is a view of our original of, of this, and we can actually look at that and where that blue thing is, right in the lower center, not the ocean, but the boxes where this sort of world class playground is. And we'll come yeah. back to that. But the next one, I think, is about some dog parks here. So again, what you were saying is uh, to be away from people, not residential areas. Uh, a, a half an acre to an acre or more. What is the size that's being proposed for Ala Moana, do you know? I think the area that was originally suggested for the Ala Moana Park was when you come in from the, uh, the ever side. entrance, right. uh, under the trees under the there. Trees. Right. It's, it's not remote, it's not big enough, there's too many people going by there, and it just doesn't meet any of the criteria for a fenced dog park. And as well as that, fenced dog parks are pretty ugly, lots of fencing. Right. Lots of ugly picture. signs and things like that. So it, it doesn't meet any of the criteria for a successful dog. And I think we got another slide on this one here that uh, might uh, show some uh, of the many rules. <laughs> wow. it's, the, it's a bit like going to Guantanamo Bay or a prison yard. Yes. There are all these scary things that the lawyers think, and so they're ugly. So yeah. you don't want them in a beautiful place, and this park is right. meant to be beautiful. So that's why... This was taken, um, I, I think I took this at uh, Hawaii Kai. Great dog park for people, but in, in remote locations, so you're not looking at all this stuff. Okay, and Bruce, one of the things, oh, the concerns about this is that it, back in 90, 1998, the city council had passed a, uh, not a guiding resolution, resolution. Uh, some kind of resolution of uh, uh, 
maybe you know policy the, resolution. Policy resolution. Thank you, Shar. Talking about balkanization of the park and the existing and imagining down the road that people were going to want to put all kinds of things in this park. And what was that resolution? How did they? Do you remember how they address that? And, uh, well, there's been so many resolutions. I need help from 98, Charlene. 98, 188, CD1. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, so 98, 188, 98 being the year that they uh, actually passed that resolution. 20 years ago, yeah. And it was a 188th resolution in the whole year. And that resolution really was there to uh, categorize the parks so that they could have in little pigeonholes uh, how, uh, the identification, easy identification of the parks for budget reasons that during the budget process they knew exactly what they were addressing. And in this particular case, I think what you're uh, alluding to is 98-188 specifies that parks like Alamoana Park are actually uh, regional parks, but regional is a subset of the bigger label, which is multi-purpose. So in Alamoana, I think they, we actually, they have actually fulfilled that requirement because they're probably a more active uh, activities in Ala Moana Park than any other park. One of the things it does say there is that um, they need to maintain open space mm -hmm. and that um, you can have active activities but you cannot put up any permanent structures. Right. So permanent structures would be like the dog park with the fence around it or like that playground with the big fence around it which is a pretty permanent structure compared to the open green space. Well they built lots of things after the war remember the, mm -hmm. the uh, what's the name right. of the the gate ball or the... Uh, yes, and they... Yeah. Uh, and those were before 1998. Yes, and so there's enough concrete and there's enough things there. And everybody agrees now all around the world that people, particularly as we're being urbanized, need open space. Just space to breathe. It, it has an amazing effect on people to be able to go into a park and feel open space. And they do that in New York with Central mm -hmm. Park. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, the, the park has this guiding document for 20 years because they realize this sort of thing, whether it was a Ferris wheel or a dog park or a, a I don't know, a, a, a world-class play, it, it, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that they said, we need to make a policy now so that it's easier just to say no more. It doesn't matter what it is because we have, we just can't put this here, but we have some other alternatives for the dog park, Brian. What did, what did your task force come up with as some solutions? Uh, the recommendation is that if you wanted to build the perfect fenced dog park not too far away, it would be Kaka'ako Waterfront Park. They've got slopes, they've got, the, the, the dog owners need trees to sit in the shade. There's lots of area there and it's remote and it's out of the way and there's lots of car parking. there. So that would be the ideal place. In the meantime, they had previously uh, wanted to put a dog park in Mother Waldron Park. That is slated to have a school built sometime. And so the, our suggestion was, if you've got a few years before they build the school, mm -hmm. put a temporary fenced dog park mm -hmm. there. And then when they build the school, take it down. And then Kaka'ako Waterfront Park might take another year or two to get the the transfer of the ownership and the funds and things like that. But that would be the perfect place. Yeah, and I just you know saw on the news, George at Deemer, talked about how they actually did agree to take over just a couple of days mm -hmm. ago and they got $2.24 million to make improvements to the park. So, you know, it sounds like a perfect time to yes. build that right in. And yeah. more money is great. coming from what more I understand. More money is coming, yes. So we have this wonderful space in Kaka'ako and obviously, as we can all see by driving by, that all the cranes are going to continue down as Kamehameha Schools and uh, uh, Howard Hughes continues to develop that Lots of high rises in the area. Those people have dogs. What percent have dogs, would you say, Brian, in this, in this country, state? Oh, my gosh. I don't know the exact number, but it's pretty high. I think yeah. it's 50% uh, or something. A lot of people have dogs. And in this area here. It's one of their selling points, right? Yes. The towers will advertise that you can bring dogs into your okay. condo. And I, that, that would be another question I would raise with the city council is, um, shouldn't there be like a zoning thing that says that every condo that has a building well, should Many have of them do. I was, in the, I was in the AO building above Whole Foods mm -hmm. recently. They have a very nice little fenced dog park right mm -hmm. by their swimming pools there. Well, I'm going to say that, 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 that those are nice for the people that just want their dog to walk one meter and, and then do his <laughs> business and come back. But if you want a dog to let, have a chance to be a dog, we need a proper dog park. Big that's one that's why if you have one acre, you can do that, and, and the dogs yeah. can run, run and race. Let's everything. go for three acres and make it even better. <laughs> no, I don't think so, because there's a lot of fencing required. Oh, and, that's true. And uh, the, the Humane Association has just donated a quarter of a million dollars to build one up near the 
uh, University Avenue. They're expensive, and as you can see from that previous picture, a lot of fencing. A lot, and then they also, if they're run by the city, they have to close them a half day a week and have staff come and maintain them. There's a lot of money involved, and that you know, you'd have to say, well, is that really a priority? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's a priority because I am a dog owner, and I say both and, not either or. <laughs> but uh, it's all good questions for the mill, and they do cost money, so we have a lot of different organizations that might come in and take over Friends of the Dog Park and that sort of thing. But in any event, we have a few more issues that we have to tackle yes. after the break. We do have a one-minute break here. I am talking today with uh, Charlene Chun Lum and Bruce Lum of Save Ala Moana Beach Park Hui, as well as Dr. Brian Bagnall president of the Greater Waikiki Outdoor Circle. It is my honor to have them today. Stay tuned and we will be back live in a moment. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Aloha, we are back and we are live. I'm Winston Welton. This is Out and About on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. Today we are talking with Charlene Chun Lum and Bruce Lum of Save Alamoana Beach Park Hui, as well as Dr. Brian Bagnall esteemed president of the Greater Waikiki Outdoor Circle. Uh, these wonderful folks are involved in uh, wanting to protect and preserve the best that we have about Ala Moana Beach Park and other areas in our city. And so that's what we're talking about today. We uh, have talked about the great things that the city has done to uh, Ala Moana uh, Beach Park already, like repaving it. We're starting to put in a lot of trees. The irrigation system. Irrigation's fixed. Um, tree the, care. Tree care. The bathrooms mm -hmm. are... Yes. Uh, Renovated, although I said I read it was nine hundred thousand dollars. It took eight months. It took eight months. Oh my goodness! Maybe that's a process we need to look at. But that's a different topic than what we're looking at today. <laughs> <laughs> However, as it's from a taxpayer's right. perspective, I gotta say, oh it's, my goodness! Yeah. But we had looked at dog parks. So, uh, Brian, you're on a. Uh, uh, I think we did the dog task parks, force. Yeah. We already talked about that and yeah. said Kakaako's the place for that. Yes. It's a better place. Bigger yes, away from definitely traffic not and, in this park. and not balkanizing, uh, so we're not violating Council Policy Resolution 98 188 uh, from 20 years ago. Uh, and we had a couple of a uh, few other issues on there. One is about parking. Okay, so the city has just repaved this lot, and I don't think they're going to restripe it right now. Um, they're, they're actually putting in some parking de uh, delineation, but question is, so, you know, this whole idea of perpendicular parking that they're proposing, um, it's pretty much unsafe, and it, we're talking about being disruptive to traffic, and truly, they just did repave it for $1.2 million. So in order to make the perpendicular parking, they're going to have to dig up more grass and trees. And, trees. And then uh, basically repave again. So when we talk about how we use taxpayers' dollars wisely, yes. that kind of makes you wonder, why would you do it? You know, because uh, you don't... And they have given us comparables to say, oh, look, we do this in other parks. But I think if you look at, well, there's the next, a couple we have slides. We a slide you know. here that shows why perpendicular parking is less safe than right. parallel parking. So you've seen this graphic before, but I don't think you've seen some of the other pictures that we have here. So on the next slide, please. So here's a picture that they said was a comparable, Sandy Beach Park. But if you take a look at this, this isn't, look at where the... Main parking is like on the other side of the right. freeway. It's not on the. It's not on the main on thoroughfare. The yeah. And Bruce, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. So uh, in the SDIS comments that they sent back to anybody who made comment about the parking, one of the things that the city has come back with is, well, there are 13 uh, parks around the island that DPR has that is comparable, that, that they are comparable. But I've 
printed out all of the Google Map pictures and so forth, and I'll tell you, there's only one that even comes close to being possibly comparable, and that's Kailua Beach Park. And Which the is the next slide. Oh, we have yeah. an excited of that. And the comparable thing, most, the strongest comparable thing is that one road you see coming from the left, yeah. and going through the main park and snaking through the park, and then coming back out over here on the big curve on the highway. Well, that's one way. So that's hardly a comparable for Ala Moana. In addition to that, these stalls were sized under the old code. So the stalls are much smaller, which mm -hmm. means there's a lot more distance between two rows of uh, perpendicular parking. So as a comparable, I find that a little hard to accept. Right. And then when you look at all the other pictures, you really get the sense that, wow, they have a lot of these perpendicular stalls, but they're kind of like Sandy Beach or less in terms of the relationship. There's another slide. We've got another slide there that shows one maybe more. one of that as well. Uh, um, oh, maybe not. <laughs> maybe maybe got taken. Yeah. But okay. um, so, yeah, it just basically is still a big question about the need to do the perpendicular parking, especially since you're making a parking lot in the keyhole, which supposedly is going to put up an, almost another hundred spaces. So that might be actually adequate for the overflow of the parking. And the question that I've actually suggested that they might want to do a survey for about a year and say, is that enough? And certainly if you don't... Yeah, it's based on some use data rather than just you know, thinking at the top of the head. Right, mm -hmm. right. This is a, da a dangerous way to park. It is, There's yeah. a lot of kids, there's a lot of activity, you can't see everything. Especially, Especially on the two-way parking because you're yes. having people that could be backing yes. out right. into traffic. Yeah. Or it's going to be a great disruption to the flow of traffic through all of Moana Park. We all know we live in a very limited space state, mm -hmm. and Oahu gets smaller. And what happens is, in today's uh, active family and uh, athletes, they use very large vehicles to bring whatever they their toys to the beach. So right. yeah. Okay, so, so let's, let's move on. Now we've, we've got yeah. another one, which is okay. So parking. That's one beach nourishment. This one has a lot of problems all over, just from environmental point of view and getting permits and all of that. But uh, let's see a picture if we got the beach nour nourishment on there, some uh, of this. And can you speak to this? Uh, sure, I can. Um, so what this, this slide shows is that the beach has various ways that our community uses this. And when we say local people use this park and local is for locals, what we mean is that anybody who's been a resident in Hawaii who really tries to coexist with the environment instead of tries to modify it in order to be more aesthetic to them or more comfortable, so what you see here is a lot of participation by many groups of many levels, so it's very diverse use of the park. And there's a next slide here that, okay. so in this slide you see that a lot of families get together. We have a group of people here. This is how they, they actually pass on the knowledge to their family as to how to coexist with uh, you know, our environment. And in Alamoana, there's a lot of ocean environment. Yeah, so the, the thing about the sand, and I don't know if there's another slide or not. We might have pulled uh, that one. Slide, maybe but um, the, the thing about the sand is they're talking about 77 cubic feet of um, sand, which cubic is yards. cubic yards, I'm sorry, which is about 21 Olympic sized swimming pools full of sand yeah. that they're going to put on this beach kind of indiscriminately because they kind of want it to look. You know, like all even for people to lie and enjoy the beach. There's a lot of big time environmental issues yes. here. This is, this is a very serious thing and not, not to be uh, messed with. And you know. collecting it, for, the collection area is sort of near to the drainage of the Alawite Canal, which has its own um, issues and that, right. that sand really hasn't been tested. I think, and uh, from what you were saying, that the, the sand would go right up to the top of the wall, mm -hmm. uh, existing wall. So. And 78 feet out. <laughs> and 70 feet eight out. So when the water comes up, it'll just wash right over the wall? And so so we, we oppose it. We think yes. it's not necessary at all. Or, or something else has to be thought or maybe of more deeply thing. about this, about how right. to do this. Because yeah. we're right. just skimming over the cultural impacts. And the, the real important one is that the impact on the actual habitat there for all of the biota and all of the uh, fish that we all enjoy and so forth that live there, you pretty much wipe out their smorgasbord. That's their, but there, their, their there table. Is, you know? so that, there, so is a, there is an elephant in the living room. Lots of problems with that. The elephant in the living Let's room. Let's go for the, the elephant in the living room, which is the site of the proposed world-class playground. So mm -hmm. we've got um, a slide another there. slide on this. And uh, tell us about the world-class playground. What's so, the issue? With it? What are the issues well, with this? If we go back to the open green space that we talked about in the very beginning and the whole concept of the park as being a place for people to of all you know all kinds of ages and abilities to be able to utilize the park the way they want to 
whether it's uh, doing sports, whether it's having, this is a permitted area. This is actually the area where the playground would be. I mean, the, yeah, the amusement park would be. So you'll see that a lot of times on the weekends, families have their weddings, their you know, baby yeah, showers. When there's big events like the lantern floating mm -hmm. and other things, this area is just full of people. So right. um, uh, engineer Robert Croning of the city said, this is dead space. Well, really? That's yeah. exactly what it's meant to be, yeah. open space. And it's enjoyed by thousands and thousands and of And back people. to that you know, ruling that you, you questioned about 98188, the thing about having it open is that people who rent it for the weekend, or not rent it, they reserve it for the weekend, they put up their structures, but they take them down. Mm -hmm. And then it's still the open yeah. space. Once you put the playground on, I think there's a picture of the playground, proposed playground, in the next slide. Let's see if we've got the proposed playground on here. Uh, yeah, so this big playground, which you don't actually see the per perimeter fencing too well, but that was one of the conditions, that they would have this fencing around to protect it at night with lighting, et cetera. And basically what it is, is we're giving away public land to private interests. So. And the city is going to maintain this? Supposedly, but, you know, look at how long it took them to repair that bathroom. Where 40 the road. years. <laughs> and, <laughs> this, this is a monster in the making, and it doesn't belong here. There's not room for it. There's not room for parking there. And it belongs in Kaka'ako Waterfront Park, where there's already a children's discovery center. And loads of parking, and it's remote, and it's uh, so... And and, and, and there's something to that effect that says that the, uh, the city or the, the, the regional plan says uh, that this space is for that in Kakako. Is that right? Right. There was an original plan. There is an original plan that says that there's supposed Cakey to be a zone. Cakey zone. Uh, be That's, perfect. Then. Right. Yeah. Next to... Um, and a cakey zone sounds like it would be for cakeys, right? Yep. To have a playground and a, right. and a park. And then next door, while their parents are walking the dogs or one parent's there, then one you right. know, grandma's over here walking. I mean, it's, a, it's really a, it's like a blank canvas. Yes, <laughs> it's really a lovely space. And now they're dealing with all the problems that, of ownership and homelessness and everything, and, and they could make that a, a treasure place. So there. we'll envision a treasured space, cakey zone, and have, again, this great, uh, parts of it are very great ideas, um, moving over to Kaka'ako, where it's just literally on the other side of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the, the, basin, the, yeah. the basin. And so we've, we've got the two very contentious elements, just move down the road a little bit where there's plenty of space, plenty and of a parking, very safe place. And a safe place. Very and safe as place. the city takes ownership of this and reclaims this for the people, it'll be... Uh, imagine that right on smack dab on Kaka'ako Gateway Park, which is very close to the bar bus line, very close to the road, easy to get to. So perfect for, for everybody. And, you know, of course, these are... This is impossible for us to solve all of these in a half an hour, but I think you all have done an amazing job of explaining these four basic issues of, you know, the, the parking, sand nourishment, the world-class playground, and the dog park needing to have something, the city look at this and say... It needs a lot more discussion, yeah. a lot more argument. We did, and we like did find what we've done, but let's leave well enough alone. And so if people want to get uh, in touch with you, they can go to Save Ala Moana Beach Park at gmail.com, Save Ala Moana Beach Park at gmail.com, or Waikiki Outdoor Circle dot org. Waikiki uh, out, uh, Outdoor Circle dot org. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for being my guest. We'll come back and discuss this again. Let's see what happens in yes. the city. But I mean, uh, let's celebrate the uh, Ala Moana Park as beautiful as it is. Thank you to our officials who have done such a beautiful job improving this. And thank you for watching our show so you can hear about community concerns on Out and About. I am Winston Welch, and this has been our show for today on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. We've been talking with Charlene Chan Lum and Bruce Lum of Stay of Ala Moana Beach Park Hui, as well as Dr. Brian Bagnall, the president of the Greater Waikiki Outdoor Circle. You can Google over those and find more information. Get involved. Call the city if you care. Thanks for tuning in, and we welcome your feedback. Thanks to our broadcast engineer, Robert McLean, our floor manager, Eric Kalander, and to Jay Fidel, our executive director, puts it all together. I'll see you here every other Monday at 3 for more of Out and About on ThinkTech. Aloha, everyone.